Can we read together, please? In return for my love, they accuse me. But I give myself to prayer. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. Lord, I pray today that you will take control of the service, that, Lord, you would feed us with your word. You will anoint the ministry of your word in the name of Jesus, and you will lead and direct and speak to every heart. Help us, O oh God, stir our hearts today to the importance, the necessity, and to the power of prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you know, the new year usually comes with a lot of resolutions. Isn't that so? Yeah. And um, rightly so. The psalmist said, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. God understands our limitation of time. So what he did is that he lovingly divided up our lives into measurable portions that we call years. Isn't that so? Um, from the very beginning in the Bible, we read in the book of Genesis, God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. He gave us the light so that we can know the years. And his word continues by saying this, the years of our life are 70. Or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and then we fly away. Mm -hmm. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, right? So the average lifespan is 70 to 80 years, depending on which country you're living in. Um, some, of course, live long, longer, have got patients into their 90s and 100 and so on. And of course, you've got those who die much younger. So let's do the math. Are you doing the math? 70 to 80. If you're liberal, you probably want to subtract your age from 80. If you're conservative, you probably want to use 70. If you're neither, you probably want to use 75 in between. So what is your answer? Well, your answer may not be correct. That's the possible, the possible average duration of the, your life. That's the time that you have allotted to you by Almighty God to secure your destiny, right? The destiny of your eternal soul and to fulfill God's purpose for your life. It's not just to live your life and say I'm saved or I'm not, and I'm going to know God or not, but what is the purpose of your life? When you stand before God, when I stand before God, He's going to ask us two questions. What did you do with Jesus? What did you do with my gift of salvation? And secondly, what did you do with the gifts, the talents, and the abilities, the resources I gave to you on the earth? What did you do with that? Did you live a very self-centered life? Did you just squander all the opportunities, all the resources, all the gifts, all the talents I gave to you? So you and I should not procrastinate on the task that is set um, before us. You know, people say, you know, when I'm older, when I'm older, then I'm going to do this. But the older folks are going to tell you, well, probably should have done it when you were younger. You know, you need to go at it when you're young. Isn't that so? You need to give it your all. Someone said this. He said, you can pay now and play later, or you can play now and pay later. Either way, you will pay. And that is so true. There are many people into their 40s and 50s who wished they would have done things a bit differently because now they're paying, because they were playing. And there were those who paid in their teens and their young adulthood who are now playing. And they say, thank God, I put in the effort. I spoke to over the holidays. There were two young ladies here in the church who were talking about, you know, school and so on. It's difficult. And I'm, you know, I'm telling them, well, you know, this is the time. Work hard. It's going to pay off later on. It's difficult now. You're paying now. And I can promise you the payback is going to come later. Amen? Amen. The Bible tells us this. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw nigh and you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Some people squander their youth. 
squander all their years. I've, you know, people talk to you, they've got their children in university, and, and they, you know, they went to university, and instead of studying, they're sporting. You know, they're drinking, hanging out with friends, late night parties, and stuff like that. And when they finish graduating, they're, well, they didn't even graduate. Or they, they don't know what to do afterwards because they just didn't apply themselves in school. So as we pass into this new year, we need to remember, we, you and I, we're checking off another year in our lifespan. That's, what, that's the point I'm making. You're checking off. 2023 is gone. It's gone. And this year is, is on us. And it's going to go. And it's going to go faster. Didn't 2023 pass quickly? It did. So what about resolutions? Some of us, we have a resolution to exercise more. You want to lose 10 pounds. You're going to run maybe jog 20 minutes or you're going to go to the gym. Gym memberships usually hit a high in terms of signing up, you know, in the, in, in the first two weeks of January. Some say, I want to pay off my credit card debt. Others, I'm going to delete um, that Amazon account. You know, you've got goals uh, pertaining to your physical health. You've got goals in terms of um, finances, in terms of relationships, um, your studies, your career. But what about a spiritual goal? Because man is spirit, soul, and body. Many will say, yes, yes, Pastor Mike, I want to draw near to God. I'm going to draw closer to God this year. But let me ask you a question. What does that look like? Is that a smart goal? How are you going to measure that? What are the indicators you're going to use to reflect you are drawing closer to God? On the 1st of February, how much different will your spiritual life be comparison to 1st of January? Are you getting me? Don't just say, I'm going to draw closer to God. What does that mean? So in this month, we usually start off with a few weeks of prayer and fasting, seeking God for his guidance, for his power, for his intervention in our lives in this new year. And I tell you, we so much need it more. I mean, I was just telling Brother Darren here, how things are different today than they were from five years ago. You wish you could probably go back to five years ago or 10 years ago. You know, life was much less complicated the way things are now. In Psalm 109, we read the words. The, 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 the psalmist said, but I give myself to prayer. Okay, these are the words, um, I'm going to come to that just now. The greatest, the very best resolution that you can make as we begin this new year is to give yourself to prayer. Richard Foster says this, prayer free frees us to be controlled by God. To pray is to change. Prayer frees us to be controlled by God, to praise. And maybe that points to something. Maybe one of the reasons why some people don't pray is they don't want to change. They don't see a need to change or they don't want to change. He says this, there is no greater liberating force in the Christian life than prayer. To enter the gaze of the holy is to never be the same. Now for the sake of context, let re let's read all the verses, um, the preceding verses in Psalm 109. He says, be not silent, O God of my praise. For wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me. Speaking against me with lying tongues. Wicked, deceitful mouths. People talking against me, speaking against me. They encircle me with words of hate. The haters. And they attack me without cause. You and I from time to time come across that in our lives. And that's so. Many of you who are working are in school. In return for my love, they accuse me. I'll be nice to them. But they're turning back now and they're accusing me. They're stabbing me in the back. But what was his response? He says, but I give myself to prayer. You see, of all the spiritual actions that reflect expressions of faith, religion or spirituality, the one that reigns supreme, the one that is outstanding is prayer. Think about these few believers. Brother A loves to study the scripture. He's a good theologian. He can quote so many different memory verses. Brother B, he attends church regularly. Every Sunday, he's there. 
Sister C, she uses Saturday evenings to share the gospel. She's feeding the poor on Saturdays also. But there is another brother. Let's call him Brother D. He's a man who spends hours upon hours in prayer. He's faithful in prayer. Of all of these, if you had to select the one person who's maybe the most spiritual or godly, I guess you're going to go to the last, but it's not so. The person who is in prayer. Contemplative prayer, meditation, intense prayer, intercession. You see, for too long we have relegated prayer to the pastor, to the intercessory group, to the elderly women in the church. Huh? But every one of us need to pray. Many of us think that we can get by with just a few sentences of prayer in times of need, or in times of distress, or before an exam, or just before an interview. Pray for me, I've got an interview. Pray for me, I'm doing an exam. Pray for me, I've got, I, I want this job, or something like that. That's the very minimum. I would call that entry-level prayer. That's prayer at the minimum. And I pray today that before you leave here, your desire will be, I give myself to prayer. And to do this, it calls for resolve. I'm going to do this. To do this, it calls for planning. You need to know how you're going to apply this to your life. To do this, it calls for commitment. You keep working on it until prayer is woven into every fiber of your being. The necessity of prayer. The importance of prayer. The fervency of prayer. So this, my, my message in one sentence, every disciple of Jesus will give himself or herself to prayer. Be a person of prayer. One of the reasons why in North America people don't pray a lot is because they've, they've got so much of their material needs taken care of. They don't think they don't need to pray. But we are under this illusion and this deception and under a lot of spiritual attack because when we slack upon prayer, our family is being, can be affected. Let's look at the example that Jesus left. First of all, he was a man of prayer. You see that? And he left us this example. He began his ministry in prayer. At the age of 30, as he's stepping into ministry, he began that by prayer. In Matthew chapter 4, the Bible tells us that after he was baptized and, and the Lord's Father spoke from heaven, the Spirit of God descended upon him, he went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil to spend 40 days in prayer and fasting. In a sense, we can say he began his ministry in prayer. Or if you want to call his ministry his career, that is what he was doing in life. This was his business in life. He started his career in prayer. He began the fulfillment of his purpose in life in prayer. And so for every one of us, we want to know what we are going to be doing in this world, in this life. We need to start that journey off by prayer. In fact, as a matter of fact, we discover that journey in prayer. But as we're stepping into it, we need to start with a season of prayer. For every young man, every young woman, every teenager, um, you're looking, you're searching, you're longing, you're seeking. You know, you need to get with God in prayer and fasting. You need to hear from God for yourself. It's good to listen to people to get advice and counsel. Beloved, but we need to hear from God. And the, the thing about the Christian, the believer, is that you and I can hear from heaven. You and I can hear from God for ourselves. We need to listen to that still, small voice deep down in our hearts. You know, something told me, or, you know, I heard, you know, I, I sensed it. That is God speaking to you. Listen to that voice. It's not going to go against the word of God. It's not going to go against the word of God. You need to shut off the, the cacophony of voices in the world, the noise that's in the world. There's so much going on, so much noise, you know, every time you see... You know, people, what we're doing now is we walk around with our, and we got our ears plugged up with, with headphones now. So even when we're quiet, there's something going on, some noise, something coming in, some voices coming in. So we're blocking out the quiet times. We need to get quiet with God. Get quiet with God. 
There's so much ambient noise, whether it's friends, the television, the internet, or even more powerful today is social media. It takes up so much time and, and we're being fed with so, so many things. And we can't hear from God. We need to be quiet. We need to be still, the Bible says, and know that He is God. Amen. Amen. Be still and hear from God. And it's never too late to start. Never too late to start. But not only did Jesus begin His ministry or His career in prayer, He also continued in prayer. We can't just start in prayer, beloved. we got to continue in prayer. His life was busy. His ministry was busy. Crowds followed him. They thronged him wherever he went. But yet we read this in Matthew 14 and 23. After he dismissed the crowds, you know, if you and I were popular, we've got thousands following. I mean, people get so excited. They've got so many followers on what is Instagram or Facebook or Snap, snaps or whatever, you know, threads, whatever you call it. There's a word for it, but I don't know. You know, so many people following you. And what we want to do is, let's stay with the crowd. Let's, let's, more people, oh, let's, no, no, no. But Jesus left the crowd and he went off by himself. The Bible says, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. How many of you know today it is important to just be alone Amen. with God? Amen. Many times we've got so many people around us. You know, listen to me. There are many people who are lonely in life. Many people who are lonely. But you can be alone and not be lonely. Amen. Because you have a friend in Jesus. Amen. And he's always with you. Amen. Never alone. And with you always to the end of the earth. In Luke 5.15, the Bible tells us, But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But again we read, But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. He set an example for us. If he, the Son of God, the God-man, with so much power at his fingertips, he can just speak the word and things happen. He can just say, peace be still, and the wind and the wave, everything is still calm. He calmed the seas with just his word. And if he saw the need to come out of his daily schedule, his busy schedule, to pray and be alone with God, what about us? The third thing I noticed about Jesus is that he had a devotional life of prayer. He prayed at the onset of his ministry. He prayed during his ministry. But he also had his devotional life of prayer. In Mark 1.35, I love this verse. It says this, And rising early. And, yeah, well it says very early. Thank you. And rising very early. It's one thing to rise early. It's another thing to rise very early. Amen? All right. While it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Make sure you rise or you get off of that bed, because if you stay on that bed to pray, you're going to fall asleep again. You know, sometimes when I come down to do my devotions, you know, I would peer through the windows, and I would see, hear the cars starting up. And it's maybe 5, 5.30 in the morning sometimes. You know, people are getting ready to go to work. And I tell myself, I remind myself, if these people are getting up at this time to go to work, they have to, I can get up to pray and see God. Amen. This is the devotional life of Jesus. Rising very early in the morning. What is still dark? The cock isn't crowing as yet, right? People are not bustling around. No one is making coffee and, you know, stuff like that. And he's up, he goes off by himself, and there he prays. Beloved, this is one of the most powerful secrets in the life of the believer. But I give myself. I'm giving myself over to prayer. If you are a person of prayer, I tell you, God will be with you. God is going to open doors and God is going to bless your life. 
And even in the most difficult trial and tribulation, you know I am in the will of God. I'm dead center in the will of God. Amen. The next point here. The Bible tells us that he prayed before making major ministry or career decisions. He didn't just do it like that. You know, before he chose the 12 apostles, this is what the Bible says. Luke 6 and 12. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. All night. He didn't fall asleep. All night he continued in prayer before God because he had an important decision to make the next day, the choosing of his disciples, the apostles. Who's going to follow him? You're choosing a university or a college to go to. You're choosing a career. Very, very important, you're choosing a life partner. Right? Choosing a life partner. Or you're moving. Some people take these things very, you know, ease flippantly and they make a decision, oh, you know what, things are not working out for me in this city, let me move to another city. Just stop and move. Did you ask God? Did you see God? And many people can make a big mess of their lives by just, you're making that decision on an economic, financial basis alone. You're not seeking God. As Christians, we need to hear from God. Amen. you got to hear from God. Because it may be tough now, but God is saying, hang in there. Listen, the Bible tells us that Isaac, in the year of famine, he planted and he reaped a thousand, a, was it a hundredfold? A hundredfold. In the year of famine, he didn't go down, go where everyone else was going. He stayed where he was because God told him to stay, and he reaped a hundredfold. And there are many people who make decisions based on just the economics. And everybody else is doing it. I'm not getting this advice or things. No, 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 no. We need to hear from God, beloved. Move when God says to move. Move when he gives you the green light. Telling my own story, one story. And this was a, a, a no answer, this was a yes answer. I remember one time someone took me up, this was an Empire State Building around the 82nd, 83rd, I can't remember which floor it was, but we were meeting some lawyers there. This guy was gonna sponsor me, say, come and be my assistant in this church. and. I'm, you have to get back into your studies, your medic. This is when I was living in Ghana. And um, I get an apartment, you can, we're gonna pay for it, you can stay there, it's for you. I didn't know how important that was. Um, but as we were there, I remember coming on the plane and reading the word and praying, seeking God in the room in the house I was staying, getting on the floor, kneeling, praying, seeking God. God, I gotta hear from you. This, I need you know, to hear from you before I make such a decision. And I'm there before the lawyer. And I've never heard God spoke to me like that. The minute the guy came and he said, okay, if this is what we can offer you, you get your worker's permit, you'll be landed in three months, and all this, we set these things up for you. I just heard the voice of God clear, saying very, very clearly, screaming almost, no. No. And if there was a holy ground moment in my life, that was it. So after I said the first no, he moved around and we were chatting again with some other folks about 10, 15 minutes and he came and said, so what do you do? What do we do here? I said, no, I can't do this. I'm not going through, heading back home and I'm staying with the church I'm with and just continue living my life there. I don't know why. God said no. Maybe he had something else for me. <laughs> but God is able to answer us. He's able to lead and direct us. We've just got to seek him, trust him. Are you hearing me? Amen. And there's nothing, as long as you know that God gives you a yes and you're going in that, you know that come hell or high water, this is, God told me to do this. You get what I'm saying? Amen. Lord, you said to do this and this is where I'm walking. This is where I'm going. And the other thing about Jesus is that he prayed when facing crises in his life, major crises. We see prayer as the habit of Jesus. It is second nature. So when it comes to the greatest crisis in his life, you can call this an existential threat. He turned to prayer. And this is what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and prayed. 
He knelt down and prayed. How, much, how many of us kneel and pray? You know, you need to probably try it. Maybe this week ahead of you, every day, make it a practice. Kneel and pray. You will see something different. There's something about that bodily position. Of, you know what kneeling does? It, it is a sign of submission to God. Recognizing this great and mighty God we're coming before. I know he's our friend, but at times we need to recognize more than that, that he's almighty God. Amen. Great, powerful, almighty God. And when we kneel, we're acknowledging his reign over our lives. So he knelt down and prayed. He said, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What is that cup? What is that cup? That cup was the wrath of God upon mankind for his sin. The wrath of God because of man's sin and rebellion against God. And Jesus was going to bear the brunt of that on Calvary. But he knew within his heart how agonizing, how cruel, how terrible this suffering, this punishment was going to be. The crucifixion and the scorching and so on. He knew that. So he wasn't just a willing saying, okay, well, you know, I'm so excited. I'm going to go die on the cross. No, no. He wasn't foolish. He knew what it cost. And he's saying, Father, is there another way? Is it possible? But he says, not my will, but thine be done. And that is what prayer does. Basically, that is the best definition of prayer. Prayer is bringing our lives, our thoughts, our desires into alignment with the will of God. Prayer is not to get God to do your will. Prayer is to get your will to align with God's will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But today, many times when people are praying, say, God, let my will be done. Would you do this for me? No, we need to ask God, what would you have me do? Amen. And the Bible says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. You see, I believe what prayer also does is that we are engaging the spiritual realm. We are doing spiritual warfare. Angels came. And they were strengthening him. And the Bible says, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's how we have prayed like that. How many of you prayed until you sweat? But that's how he prayed. Go ahead this week, kneel and pray. You know, there's a beautiful picture you see sometimes on Google if you check it out. We can't put it up for copyright reasons. Excuse me. Have you seen a picture of a, a little child, a boy, kneeling beside his bed and he's praying? He's kneeling praying and his dog is beside him kneeling in prayer too. <laughs> his dog is doing exactly what he's doing. The prayer of Jesus captures the overarching power of prayer. Not my will, but his sneeze is gone. But thy will be done. You see, Jesus was going to the cross. And so he needed the power of God, he needed the strength of God, he needed the grace of God to endure the crucifixion. Praise God. Um, you see, the prayer life of Jesus was so powerful, so exemplary, that the disciples came to him and they asked, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And, you know, and I guess that's something we all need to learn, isn't that so? Lord, teach me how to pray. Pray more effectively. Because the Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God didn't just call us to pray for the sake of praying. He called us to pray because he says, ask and it shall be given. Amen. 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 Finally, he had a major impact on the prayer lives of his disciples. Did they learn? The Bible says this in Acts chapter 1. 
They returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olives, which then Jerusalem is seven days journey away. When they had entered, they went to the upper room, and there they were staying, Peter and James and John, and all these with one accord, the Bible says in verse 14, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And after 10 days of prayer, the Bible says, they devote, the Holy Spirit came. It was the day of Pentecost. The Bible says in Acts 2 and 42, they devoted themselves to, to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They devoted themselves to prayer. You know, so the prayer meeting is oftentimes the least attended service in any church. Peter and John, the Bible says in Acts 3 and 1, they were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. This was the time of prayer. You know, the early church was a praying church. And every church of Jesus must be a praying church. I give myself to prayer. Is that something that you would say at the start of this year? But I give myself to pray. See, Jesus said this. He told his prayer, he says, Men ought always to pray and not to give up or not to faint. All right? In, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, When you pray, not if you pray, when you pray. He says, Ask that it will be given you, seek you will find, not the door will be opened unto you. Everyone who asks receives. Don't be afraid to ask God. He says, if my words abide in you, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will and it will be given unto you. He says, I tell you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I thank God the government is not my source. Amen. My job is not my source. Amen. The Canadian economy is not my source. God is our source. You see, we serve a God who is able to hear and answer prayers. We serve a God who is able to open up the doors that are closed. Amen? And when people try to give you a hard time and make things impossible for you, God is able to break through all of that. Amen. And work miracles. Your prayer life is an indicator of your love and your commitment to God. Do you know that? Amen. Your prayer life is an indicator of your love for God, your commitment to God. It separates church goers from children of God. Many people go to church, so they don't pray. But the Christian, the true follower of Jesus, the true child of God, will spend time, will give himself to prayer. It separates so-called Christians from true Christ followers, and it reflects your spiritual life. So today I ask you, would you say like the psalmist, but I give myself to prayer. Can we stand together, please? Praise God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Praise God. Lord, we worship you today. We thank you, God, for your word which encourages us to be people of prayer. He say men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to give up. You told us in your word to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. To pray fervently. Especially as we see the time, the days we're living in God. The circumstances we face in life with our families, with the church, with our communities, with our cities, with our nation, and the world we're living in, God. As so many people need to know you, we ask that you would raise up a people of prayer. Let this church be noted for its prayer, its prayer life, in the name of Jesus. Help us as individuals, as Christians, God, to be able every single day to lock ourselves away in our homes and pray, and pray, and pray. Seek you, call upon your name. Seek your face diligently, fervently, O oh God, in your word and in prayer, I pray in the name of Jesus.